Happy New Year and welcome to 2023. I'm so happy that Date with Danu also falls as we dawn this brand new year. A lot of new challenges, a lot of new things for us to look out for and I'm super excited to take this journey along with you. Today on the show it's all about inspiring, about doing good and also seeing what we can contribute to the society that we are a part of. I have three ladies who have done the same and they and their stories are definitely something that's going to bring in 2023 on a good note. Let's get on with the show. Hi, I'm Sulochana Segera. Uh, hi, I'm Kaushalya Navaratna from Seva Lanka Foundation. Are you Bovan? I'm Shan Korea. Actually, I'm here to talk about Sri Lanka, women, and also about the future of our economy. I'm representing Seva Lanka Foundation, so I'm going to talk about the development work carried out by the organization and also the contribution that the organization has done in the last 30 years in various parts of Sri Lanka. People ask me what Ape Lanka is about, and it's simply to go into areas that have been forgotten, areas where people are marginalized, where people have no hope, and give them what we take for granted. So for me, Danu, first is he's a good friend. Secondly, I like what he does because he doesn't judge people and he's very authentic. Uh, I think Danu uh, caters to a diverse uh, group of people not just sticking to one group of people, but uh, let his shows have many diverse groups of people come share their individual experiences, experience of their entities, companies. And also he's a very uh, laid down, lively person who can, I think, talk with anyone and make the show uh, and the context interesting. He has this uncanny ability to spot something when it first starts, like he spotted Ape Lanka, and supports these organizations to do something to benefit people. And you see the ladies. Uh, so this is a bit of a different show. We are going to speak about uh, why they do what they do and why do they go beyond their comfort zone and put themselves through so much of work to get their work done. So uh, with me, I have Sean on that side. Now, I have known her for a long time um, and we sort of sort of moved away like I've not followed up on her work but I was very happy that I recently got acquainted to her again and I was able to see in what force that she's still doing it. Um, Sulochan of course she's uh, quite a known face and also the face that you see on our platforms as well. Uh, her work in empowering women and the youth has been remarkable and awarded as well and we have this young lady who I actually met for the first time right? Yeah. Now, you are with a very interesting um, organization that sort of works with issues that propped up during the war and that's what inspired you. Yes. Why don't you tell me about, we'll start with you, yeah. why, like during the war everyone used it as a platform, including the government, as a platform and a reason to use it for a money gaining mm -hmm. platform. Why did the youth feel it's important to seek peace, to seek a resolution in it? Yeah. Um, so I'm Kaushalya, I'm representing Seva Lanka Foundation. Seva Lanka Foundation started its operations in 1992. So this is at the stage where the war was happening in the North and the and East. Also it was the peak, 92 <coughs> to yeah. 95 was... Correct. So although we started as a development organization to do a lot of livelihood related work, uh, we had to look at the relief and the resettlement work in the North and the East as well. And I have to mention that we were one of the national organizations that was allowed to wo uh, work with the LTT controlled areas during that time. Mm. So we were um, uh, given the permission to come inside and work with the affected communities with relief and rehabilitation activities. So um, coming to your question about the youth, so I would say that it's the youth that suffered the most because their generation didn't understand the historical connection, the Tamils, the Sinhala, and the multi-ethnic uh, community, the culture that existed in Sri Lanka. Because when I hear from my parents, that generation, there was an era mm. where they lived peacefully, and you know? Very, yeah. very, very amicably, yes. and it was natural, yes. right? But the media or what the youth heard during that time was okay. 
So the Sinhalese are attacking the Tamils, or to that extent, there was animosity, right? So I think it was important, especially uh, when the uh, war ceased, to work with the youth, also to bring in certain very delicate aspects of peace and reconciliation, to work through certain, certain cultural aspects, to once again bring in uh, what Sri Lanka lost. So I believe among other organizations, we have also contributed working with youth and other different categories in that uh, aspect. Brilliant. Uh, there's always uh, a different side to the war that people tend to not see. Uh, the effects of the war might have ended in 2009, but what happened because of the war is going to continue for a long time. Uh, we'll t touch on that, uh, but I wanted to speak to Sulochana. Uh, your story to inspire women and start something called Women in Management um, and also like recognize them, recognize these individuals. Why did you find a reason to concentrate especially on women? So starting from Kaushala because for me I think it's a craziness was there <laughs> and uh, also I had a very bad conscience that every time when I see something I feel guilty that I'm not doing something. So just after the war everyone was talking about women empowerment and I didn't see an empowerment which I wanted to see. Right. So that was the main reason for me and also I saw that there were Sri Lankan women who should be recognized so that the youth can follow rather than we bring out women who are not lived in Sri Lanka. So that was one of the main reason for me to start recognizing Sri Lankan women. But to start women in management, I want to change that concept that we need to depend on someone to develop us. For me, um, self-resistance and also the self-confidence matter. And my story itself, the rejection and judgment, and also for me, uh, the ethnic, because I was brought up with Tamil, Sinhalese, and Muslims. So I never felt uh, that I'm a Sinhalese or an I, because I, I used to feel that my father sp uh, spoke around five languages. Mm. And for me, uh, my mother comes from Vatal, but my father comes from Kotayana. So I didn't feel that even my business partner today is a Muslim. So I never felt that I belong to one ethnic group. I want to change that and I thought unless me, myself change, I cannot do a change. So that was the, the start. start. Oh, you're a Kotena girl. Yes. We also, we also have Katena genes. <laughs> All right, we're going to come back and speak to Shan and about uh, Ape Lanka uh, because uh, she, she's also finding it really hard to sit up in this manner that we have asked her to. <laughs> and uh, if you know Shan, uh, it's very rare that you get to see her in this. She said she couldn't recognize herself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you after the break. Do stick around. It's day to done. Welcome back to the show. It's the first and we're starting off a brand new year. Uh, now, I want to move to Shan. This work that you do with uh, Ape Lanka, very ground level work. There's nothing so fancy about it and you have a long drive. Your chosen area of Sri Lanka is also very precise for you. Tell me about it. Tell me about the project. Well, basically, Ape Lanka is an organization where we try our level best to give people what we take for granted. And our idea is not to parachute in and out of areas, Danu, but rather to concentrate in one area and find out from the people themselves what they need in order of priority and one step at a time to try and help them. Now, it's a kind of a trailblazer thing because it's not the way a lot of people work or they think we should work. I sometimes get criticism <laughs> on that. But I want to go there and make a difference in the entire community's life and make a blueprint so that we can say, hey, look at Poonahari, look at Pachiapali. And it's areas that have been forgotten, where people are marginalized, where people suffered tremendously in the war, as we were talking about. And see, because we help them, because people help them, 
people came forward to do what they can. This is the change that we've made in the people's life. Uh, one of the most amazing experiences I have had there is uh, after we had a need-based assessment and we spoke to all these women and we said, what do you want us to do? What are your needs? This lady came from nowhere and she gave me a big hug and I was like, why are you hugging me? I haven't done anything yet. And her answer was so simple and it has touched me and it has motivated me and a lot of people because she said, because you care. And that's what Ape Lanka is about. The fact that people care. And when I look back and people say, how did you manage to give all 24 schools in Punahari water? How do you manage to give bikes to children to cycle to school or you give water to the villagers? It's simply because the musicians sang and we had a concert and we raised money. Or hospitality industry people supported us and we auctioned their rooms and their hotels and their experiences and we managed to raise money and artists painted and we had all the communities of different types of people coming together and saying, you know, we, we may not have money to give, but we have our talent. But we have our talent. We are willing to give our resources. We are willing to give our time. And I think that's the success story of Ape Lanka, where it's people coming together because they care and they want to help a community that is so in need and who stretched out their hand to us. You know, Danu, I always think when a community like that stretches their hand out to us and we can help them in some way to give them hope, uh, to make them feel that we care about them and they are not forgotten, that's very important. Because this is just a window of opportunity that we as a people have to create an Ape Lanka we are proud to call our home. Amazing. Um, I'm coming back to Seva Lanka. I wanted to ask you, we live in a, <clears throat> in a society where we, people are quick to judge. Actually, this is for the three of you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always a story, oh, these ones in Colombo are just using us to earn money. They're putting up events and putting up cocktails and they're having shows. Now, for example, if, if, if somebody wants to pull a fight, they pull a fight on those lines saying that, are you these ones just take the money for themselves? Then why couldn't they save that money and come and give it to us? But the problem is if you do not organize an event, there's not going to be a way of collecting the funds. Tell me, what, how have you all answered this question? Because I'm sure it might have been thrown at you all. So Chana is already, <laughs> she has already answered. <laughs> So I may go first. Yeah. 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 So you know my food program, right? Yeah. Which I started before the crisis. So there, so there was like everyone is saying, okay, it's good you are giving food. Why you want to put pictures, mm. right? So I have said this is not my money. People has trusted and given me, and some people are not living in Sri Lanka. Correct. They should know whom to be gave, and they should be put it out. So it's sometimes people just judge you not just because they hate your cause mm -hmm. they hate something that is not there that they cannot do so my best this thing is you know let people judge you it's okay to be judged but if we try to answer them then it means that we also judging them so i have been those days when i was young i mm. used to be very arrogant and reply them then i realized you know so whatever they do, the people are getting. I don't care who does it, as long as the cause is there mm. and people are happy. For example, sometimes now I've been doing this for 15 years. There was started in 2009, just after the war. Actually, when I started the recognizing of, I didn't have my, no one sponsored me then. I actually mortgaged my house for the first award. And it took me five years to get it out from that because <laughs> I was a single mom yeah. and people call me crazy but I did that not getting any benefits but the women whom I have recognized from the rural to the corporate to the international level has made an impact to the people who they may have not have seen so let people may always even if you do good even if you do bad they will always question you and they will judge you that's their story but never get into that story because your values and qualities are too different. Amazing. How was it for you? 
Well, my uh, experience in this whole thing is that if people say anything to them, I just relate stories that have actually happened there and which I have experienced and I have seen for myself. And uh, then it touches them. Yeah. It really touches them. Like recently, I uh, came back from Poonahari on uh, Saturday and I was talking to some people and they said, you know, how was your program, Shan? What do you do? And I said, an amazing thing happened when we were giving exercise books. I asked a child what his name was and he jumped up and gave his name. And then every child who was there introduced Continue. themselves. Mm. And it suddenly made me feel and I told them, look, a child is not a statistic. Mm. A child is not a box that you tick. They are a human being with feelings, with opinions, with hopes, <laughs> with their own unique personality. And that's what we try to do. We try to help them to realize their full potential. So I always say believe in yourself, right? Believe in your dream, believe in your cause, and be true to yourself. And that's what we really need to do, whatever anyone else has to say or whatever their opinion is. Uh, because I still remember the first event that you had at uh, the Range Rover studio, uh, uh, the, the showroom, when I actually said that I'm going to host it and we are going to speak to a family that has come all the way from Puneri to speak to them about their life as well, this person who was with me said, my, as if they will know what Range Rover Studio is and why are you going all the way into that? <laughs> so I said, the location is free. Like everything has been given free by them. That is their way of supporting this cause. But then you are exposing them to uh, something like this. Their life problem right now is not to buy a Range Rover. <laughs> they, their life's problem is to eat a meal, send their kids to school yeah. and live because not everyone wants to drive a Range Rover. So, um, so that's how people tend to not see the bigger picture, but see the immediate picture. Uh, I need to come back uh, to speak about um, the question that I asked you, because I don't know how your organization handles it. When we do come back, please sit down. Welcome back to the show. I really wanted to speak to Kaushalya about the same crisis that you're going through because surviving an with an organization from 92 till today, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. That's like 30 odd years. Yeah. Tell mm -hmm. me about it. Yeah, so um, I'm probably in the third <laughs> management right, <laughs> right now, yeah. after third, three decades. Yeah. So uh, Sevalanka started quite small. Uh, working in the north and the east and the dry and zone came areas. Up this concept in Anuradhapura. Yeah, so we started in Ampara and Radhapur, right. the dry zone areas under the Jana Soviet Trust Fund. During that right. time, there were certain NGOs working on social mobilization and things like that. So then uh, we moved into the relief, rehabilitation, resettlement activities, both in the north as well as uh, in the east. Uh, and then slowly uh, we shifted to other areas, then tsunami hit. Uh, then we covered a lot of areas in the island with again the similar activities. So our approach is we start with relief activities but we make sure the communities um, have long-term development and self not, not self-reliance but they rely on their the own, they take they, ownership yeah. and uh, they develop. So it's a comprehensive development package at the end. So we work with them on supporting in livelihood skills and we support them with uh, seed grants and things like that so it, it, it's it's a lot to do with the whole development package right so uh, coming that long way of course there are lessons learned mm. <laughs> so one of the lessons would be so the organization has to expand from about I think uh, 200 300 staff uh, before tsunami to 1,000, 1,200 with tsunami. Mm. And the organization decentralized. So there were a lot of pluses and minuses in that as well. And also they have a problem. Like <coughs> there is an issue when they say, if, when you give funding, it's going into their salaries and their AC cars and yeah. all of that. Uh, so yeah. there is certain challenges there as well to organization like ours, but it's minimal because we are considered a national organization. Right. So our pay and everything goes according to the national scale. Uh, so the main challenge we faced was so after 2009, 
we had a couple of years where we worked with the war affected communities again with a lot of development projects even like uh, uh, making schools uh, doing actually half of the requirement of the semi-permanent shelter from the manic farm to the resettlements mm. Uh, then came 2012, where Sri Lanka was uh, marked as a middle-income country, yeah. where the traditional <laughs> multilateral, bilateral <laughs> donors suddenly Just, shifted. Yeah. They were like, y'all are now standing up on your own feet. Yes, so yeah. there were more hotspots. So this was not a very correct decision uh, because uh, there were a lot of pockets still yeah. needed uh, support. support. So for a large organization like ours, you were hit. thousand staff had to be reduced to 500, 400. So while doing that, all the, the bureaucracy, the legal issues, so the organization has to go through a lot of restructuring as well. So it has been a learning curve. So we are currently down to 100 Whoa. members of staff. <laughs> That's but a lot to lose from 1,200. <laughs> But still continuing work in the prioritized yes, areas. Okay. That's amazing. So, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, because all three of you, in some point, have been inspired during the war or because of the war, and that has created these avenues. I wanted to ask you, this is something that the international communities, especially the Sri Lankans who live there, also have a very strong opinion. And because you have, a, you have a project also in Canada, and Canada is one of the countries that creates a bigger voice about it. I want to ask you, what do you think about the day when the war ended? There's a lot of human rights violation cases on it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that day? I want your opinions on it. Because I think it's very, very important because there's a huge diaspora community that watches this show. And I want to hear it because you have spoken to the people from those areas. Mm -hmm. I will tell you my stories as well after I hear from you. Shall I start with you? I think that basically uh, where the when the war ended a lot of people in the north were very happy because they finally realized that they could grow and they could prosper and they would have a life and that's one of the key words i hear when i talk to people in terms of their education or in terms of their dreams they say we have a life now they have a hope and they want to be a united country uh, they are very happy when we support them, they appreciate what is going on and I get the feeling that they do not want to go back to that situation and they want to get to know the people from the south and they want to build bridges. Uh, case that happened this last week, I seem to be relating all these stories from last week because they are fresh in my mind and a lot of the people in the divisional secretariat are following courses in Sinhalese because they want to learn Sinhalese and they say they may be transferred to Sinhalese areas mm -hmm. and even uh, the students and lots of the Gramanigadari officers they all want to learn in uh, Sinhalese they do speak Sinhalese some of them and most of them can understand and uh, when we handed over one of the RO plans to Pachiapali school last week Masa school it was just amazing because the divisional secretary, uh, secretary, he hoisted the Sri Lanka flag and we all got up and everybody uh, sang the Sri Lanka national anthem. They had the bands playing, they had the school children out on the field, uh, you know, singing and playing and it really touched my heart. And I thought, you know what, we truly are becoming a united country living in peace with one another. And that's an amazing way to go into 2023, right, Danu? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, Lachana, how was it for you? So, for me, I, I really think war is ending was one of the happiest days. But for me, my, uh, I was in grade three, 83 in Kotahena when everything started, right? And for me, is something that I really... Uh, felt sad because I grew up, I didn't know there was a, uh, if I say it in Sinhalese, I, my best friend was a Tamil guy. So I used to tell him, <laughs> then he used to say, <laughs> because I never felt of bad for him calling me para Sinhala, yeah. because we never had that kind. Yeah. But when the war, this was because we, I lived with the war. Yeah. When it, it was said out of love. It was just It was said out of, yeah. yes. <laughs> so we, I never felt. But I have traveled everywhere in Sri Lanka. I have worked everywhere north to east to south 
And coming in these, I, I always said when people ask me uh, from where you are, I always say I'm a Sri Lankan because I never tell my race or religion. For me, my race and religion is how I live. So I always practice. When I went after the war, I started my work in North. They first rejected me because I'm from. But when I, now I was just telling Kaushal, I signed there for their marriages. Mm. I'm the only single girl who goes to the eastern side and work with Muslim women because for me, they are my Sri Lankans. I never felt bad. So for me, whether it's a war is ended or not, are the war in ourselves, the perceptions, the attitudes, the respect has to be ended. Because we don't, we, we are trying to, as she correctly said, we are trying to change them the way we want. Just accept and respect people as Sri Lankans. For me, that is what I want for 2023. Call ourselves Sri Lankans, just respect their cultures, their languages, and their religions. Because everyone is different, but end of the day, we all are humans. Mm. Forget about being a woman or a man or a whatever you call it, or whatever the race you're coming. I was happy it was ended, but I didn't celebrate. Because for me, whether you are uh, a terrorist, whether you are an army, whether you are a civilian, it's a human. And, and I know it because I have seen it. So happy it's ended, but no more wars. And that can only be done by women. a lot of work because we cannot be a shame-oriented society and sometimes we have a tendency of being a shame-oriented society and we uh, sweep things under yeah. the carpet. We have to acknowledge that there is a huge uh, disservice that has been done especially to the younger generation and that's why I spend a lot of time in one of our projects called Peace and Reconciliation through Sports and Arts where we take children from Colombo to the north and they live there in the schools and the children from the north come to, uh, to Colombo and we through games and uh, through cricket matches and football matches through art and drama we put the get uh, kids together really frankly I'm not interested whether we have a, a cricket match or a football match or they play Hora Police or Lan Run and Catchers it's just that the kids are getting Get to. to know each other and they are building their own relationships and they are finding out for themselves who they are and mm. that is the most amazing thing. We, today I had an experience where a young guy from Colombo, a young boy from St. Thomas's College, his mother called me Danu and he said, you know, he wants to have a fundraiser during the holidays to raise money for exercise books for the kids in Poonahari. Mm. And I don't really mind whether he earns or contributes 1,000 rupees or 25,000 rupees. But the fact, the fact that is, is that, that he, he cared. That his and mind thought yes. that. Yes. And that is a huge and thing. And that is, that is where the reconciliation really starts, where they want to do something for people. They want to go and find out who these people are and work together in any way they can. Amazing. We're going to get into a break because I think I need to get into a break. Yes, we have to. We'll see you after this. Please. Welcome back to the show. Uh, so the point that we spoke about is what happened on the um, on the 19th of May uh, in 2009 when everyone celebrated. 19th, right? Thank God, my memory is still there. <laughs> uh, when we celebrate at the end of the war. Um, and I have openly spoken about it as somebody who comes from the North, who has been through the war. Uh, I'm very happy that it ended. And there were a lot of people who said, oh, how can you say that there were so many people who died on that day? Um, the, the, very, the very reason I say it is, uh, I came to Colombo during the peak of the war and I was able to live, dream, have ambitions, have a goal, and achieve those in a capacity that I could. If I had stayed back due because of the war till 2009, I've lost my youth, I've lost my, some part of my teens, I've lost my 20s, for what? Because of the war. At least now, the kids there can dream, they can be a part of a reality show, they can commute to any part of this country, they have a national ID that actually takes them anywhere, loves them. 
it gives them a reason to celebrate. So I say, as we celebrate all those lives that we lost for 30 years as war heroes in some way, why can't these people be celebrated? Because they sacrificed their life for the future to think so, and the future to rejoice and live and make memories. I think we need to oversee that point. Um, but of course, justice needs to be served for people who might have done it merciless. That is a different story. But as people, as citizens of our country, I think we need, we need so much more given. And um, we, we tend to see everything from the point of view of Colombo, unfortunately. There's so much more <laughs> than what we see in Colombo. I know your work may let you all take, introduce you all to different types of people, people who are not aware, people who have been living in a box, a box of comfort, a box of security, box of entitlement. How do you all <laughs> explain to them what you do and why you do it? <laughs> well, like I said earlier, it's always best to say it the way it is and to tell them real life stories uh, that shock them because they had never thought of it before. You know, you tell people that people don't have water or safe water. It's like, oh my gosh, is that true? We never knew it. And then when the coin drops and they realize this, they, they really want to help. And also, you know, when you tell them that people, women, though they have huge gardens that they can plant, actually sometimes half an acre or one acre of land. This new project we introduced after COVID, which was called uh, We Grow Our Own Food. We started helping uh, women there to cultivate their home gardens. And, and why not men, I'm asking? Why not men? Because the men were fishing. Okay. And they were, uh, their jobs were seasonal. <laughs> no, because I, I'm saying this as, a po as something that I have noticed. Even, even with the beach cleanups, we see the women working. That's because the men have just, just drunk the whole night before and they're just cocked off on a seat somewhere. And I've been to these um, Sarvodhya places and I'm just so shocked about how much they contribute towards the livelihood of the home. That's why and I asked the, you. you know, and it's amazing thing, Dano, I'm glad you mentioned that because when we went to one of the home gardens, a daughter who took me around the garden and, you know, I was plucking the bandakas and the vetakulus and stuff with her, she was saying that the father and the mother now work together in the garden and mm -hmm. he comes back from fishing or when it's the varakam kale, which is... Uh, so where they can't yeah, go to Where they can't the go fishing. They are actually cultivating their garden. So what we are doing is we are making undercultivated land cultivable and we are expanding more land. But mm. what I wanted to say was... Without doing that, we are planting in our roundabouts and having polluted <laughs> one <laughs> And <Okay>. I like... <laughs> it was really... Uh, I was so happy because when I went there and we had positioned this as we grow our own food because yeah. I didn't want to give them hope and think that they can make a business out <laughs> of this. They were saying, you know, look, we are earning 500 rupees a day by selling the excess uh, crops. And then another lady was saying she had started a pa uh, sort of a saving book for her son and now they don't have to worry about the son's education. Mm. And these are the kind of uh, things that happen. So when you talk about these stories or you tell people what happened and a lot of people who are really interested now, more and more people are coming to visit the project and meet the people themselves they get so involved and they get so motivated to contribute of themselves, mm. their resources, their time. It's like a visit to the zoo for them. They're like, <laughs> oh my God, there's so much poverty in this country. I couldn't see. But actually, why can't, what you're doing makes sense because clean air is there. Like, yeah. you know that the roundabout in town hall has Wambatu growing. Yeah, so same. I was seated in the car and thinking, Whoever eats this Vambatu will just like die the next day. <laughs> <laughs> like so much of pollution around it. Um, Sulisha, when you speak to people who are far from reality check, um, how do you handle it? Because I know you say it as you see it. Yes. So I'm not a sugar coated <laughs> one because that has got me into trouble yeah. also. But I don't mind. Uh, what I, because I'm the one who bridged this corporate to the rural yeah. actually. 
what I, I really want to say is now, for example, it, yesterday I was at Off Mathara doing a, because they were asking me for food for so many days, so I went there personally. And to see that, what, what she said, it's beautiful school. Yeah, the principal age was, I couldn't believe, 35 years, okay. right? <laughs> but they didn't have water. The police took me and there were 175 children. They said, Miss, we can't eat here, we can't wash our hands, we don't have water. So there itself, I called people and said, you come here, you see it. And they came, actually. So I know because the school called and said, few people came. But how I bring them is, I, I always tell them, because uh, at my awards, I bring these women and families to my award. And some of them, I, if you remember, Danu, I brought a road cleaner uh, to recognize her. Because without them, we can't have a life. Then some people put me on, say, at the top 50 awards, you're giving a road cleaner an award. Are you mad? You're putting our status down. Can we stay one day without our garbage being picked up? Can we stay? So I have actually given them, I don't go and tell them, I just put them and say, this is the reality, you believe it or not. <laughs> right? Because some people doesn't want to, because we are, Sri Lankans are not good listeners. Yeah. We love to talk, we love to preach, we love to give advice. Yeah. So I have done talking, I don't talk about it. I just go and put it and you believe it or take it or leave it. That's my way. Let people hate me, let people take Because people who knows me knows that I work on reality. Rather, so they people, because some people you can't change Dhanu. And it's no point of trying to change people unless they are ready to change. So my stories has been very reality and I have, I, I still remember in 2010 when I did a program in Jaffna of Jaffna. Mm -hmm. Actually, widows are not allowed to dress brides. Yeah. I brought a Malaysian uh, artist to Sri Lanka. Actually, this was funded by Malaysian women group called NAVEM, National Association of Women. And I got 30 women to go through this program. I still remember the young women, one, one girl, was just 20 years said I never met my husband only at the uh, wedding because they got me married because they thought that I will be taken for them for the terrorists, terrorists. so they and she has never slept also she said but I'm called a widow and they don't allow uh, invite me for weddings that's because he has died he has <laughs> died right so during that program a uh, one brother came and said she can't dress she's a widow and they took but these ultimately 25 girls were there and they uh, did that program and they said now they are not accepting us no one comes to us i brought them in 2011 to colombo and i asked them to dress all the miss sri lankans wow. and he did a fashion show in kingsbury and i gave i didn't even charge anyone i said i just want people to see, see. And this Malaysian lady, Vanita Krishnamurti, she came from Malaysia and she helped. She dressed all, I think, 20 uh, Miss Sri Lankans, the contestant on uh, the bridal dress in Tamil, mm -hmm. right? And she, they put it. And I know three of them still has good salons there. Two went to UK and they all keep in touch. So you don't need to tell people. You just bring them. These are the success stories. Yeah. This is the way I work. <coughs> yeah, these superficial norms of believing you don't become a widow because you want to be. <laughs> you are not a murderer. <laughs> uh, let's get into a break. We'll see you after. Welcome back to the show. We are speaking to three inspiring ladies about the work that they do. Uh, Kaushalya, you, you are young. Mm -hmm. You are not young. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Huh? I specifically just said you're young. You could have chosen anything. You could have done anything in this world. Yeah. Now here you have to like sacrifice salary, fancy things, <laughs> um, and also like work. Why? Well, the first inspiration is my father. He's the one who has been in the community development field from the age of 18. Uh, in, I think when he was about 30, he started Seva Lanka Foundation. And now, of course, he's retired, but uh, from the small days, I have seen the sacrifices he made and also going, uh, being a Sinhala, going all the way to North and the East, 
uh, having that passion to serve the communities at that time who was underserved. Uh, I think I saw his passion and out of the three children I was the only one who decided to pursue it as a career. So in uh, 2003, soon after I finished my higher education, led by it. that passion, I joined Seva Lanka Foundation. And I'm happy because it's a blessing to help and become a blessing to the underprivileged and the marginalized. Yes, there are a lot of sacrifices, but uh, at the end of the day, it's self-satisfying. And I have two kids as well, and um, I see them also uh, learning life skills from going with yeah. me to the field, seeing the reality. And so, not living in a bubble. Yeah, so because I believe. Can be, yeah. yeah, so I believe it's also, you are blessed also in a way to choose a career like this and serve because not everyone gets that opportunity. But also I must say, if you're a politician <laughs> or somebody who's supposed to run this country, you should actually feel ashamed for the only reason, like when you're bad at a job, somebody will recruit yeah. another person and put them above you. They're like, mm, become fine. So, you know, it's just like got somebody who can actually do the job. It's like that. Y'all couldn't do the job. So because of that, people like this had to come up and do it. Kind of a sad story, no? For them. <laughs> <laughs> like if it was a private company, they'd been all fired by now. <laughs> <laughs> But the people has the power to fire them. On but they won't. Road. Everyone's secret is in somebody's hand. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that's yeah. a culture <laughs> here, no? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> to those who are watching, this year, what would you say that we should add change about our lives in the way we think, the way we see this world, and the way we see this country? Because I think this year is going to be very challenging. We went through power cuts, fuel crisis. For me, it was like, oh my God, I'm living my Jaffa life all over again. <laughs> <laughs> like, we are so used to power cuts. Like, we have studied and all during no power. So it was such a common life. So I'm like, oh my God, we're going back in time. But a throwback like that is not a throwback that I want to celebrate. But tell me, what should we look out for this year? Okay. You start. So first thing I said, be accountable. Be responsible and stop judging others. And also have, Sri Lankans are full of sympathy. I want Sri Lankans to take out the sympathy word and replace it with empathy. Definitely. Because we actually, we are more focused on others' life than our lives. It's high time that we actually reflect our own self and be a mirror to us. We, are, we have to be a mirror to us rather than we actually look at with glasses and with colored glasses about others' life. This is what I think Sri Lanka doesn't have, have a economical, political, whatever the issue, I think first thing is we have attitude issue mm -hmm. and we are a jealous country. That has to come out. Stop being jealous with, not with people whom you do not know, people with who you know, people who has been your friends, people has, who has been your family. The day we start that, the Sri Lankan politically or economically, socially, everything can be changed. So that is my message and that's going to be my, actually my way of living and I've tried m the way of living. I'm not a perfect, but imperfect me has made me who I am. Amazing. From you. I think we are walking through a tough time, Sri Lanka. We are walking through the fire again, maybe a wilderness in the challenges that we are facing and we should just try and get out of our comfort zone and try and ask ourselves what can we do to make lives better for other people and moreover what can we do to create a Sri Lanka that we want to live in and what is binding us and what is preventing us from realizing our full potential so those are the questions that we have to ask. Why are we walking through this situation? What is binding us? And challenge ourselves to get out of the comfort zone knowing, hey, this is a situation we are in, but it's a window of opportunity. There's a window out there. We can make a change. And the chain be change begins now. Let's not lose this chance. Amazing. Uh, you know, what you said about the society is very true. We are so reluctant to even give a round of applause. We are so reluctant to give a compliment to someone. 
uh, if you check Facebook <laughs> in today's language, there'd be like 7,000 views with like one like. <laughs> that just shows that 7,000 people have come to see Mukhatami Pariyagarane. But <laughs> only one of them are like, <laughs> so uh, that is reality. I think we need to break that. Uh, when I see Britain's Got Talent, I'm like, how are they even applauding to some of these people who are <laughs> dancing like, like an iskedi, like just trying to swim through water. Like an iskedi dance gets more applause than our people like, like sweating and doing the whole running and turning. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> We have to be honest with ourselves, yeah. yes. what is binding us and then we have to break those cords so that we can gallop into the country yeah. we want to live in. So uh, 2023, give those compliments. I think it's very important. It's a nice feeling when somebody smiles on your account. Uh, well, it's time that we wrap up. Uh, thank you so very much. I think the three of you, the, what, what you do, what you share and what are the beliefs that you have really has um, contributed so much in keeping this country glued, although it is broken in many ways. Um, if you are inspired, go out and do something that you want to do. Uh, there's so much that we can do, and it's always nice to know that you are a part of somebody else's change that benefited them and you and this country. Uh, it's always a wonderful feeling. On that note, I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you for being here, ladies. You. Absolutely you. amazing. We would also like to say a big thank you to Lakshan, who's unfortunately not here. He really wanted to be here, but he also does some brilliant work. Uh, he's a common friend to the three of them as well. Thank you so much for the work that you do. On that note, we need to wrap things up. Have a good year. It's a wrap.